Welcome to the Crisis on Infinite Earths, an audio telling told to you by comic storian, that's me, on our channel where we do audio dramas on a regular basis. This is a full story where we collect a lot of our older videos and combine them into one long narrative, allowing you to sit there and enjoy them without having to find the next video. Crisis on Infinite Earths is concluding on the CW, so we thought it was time to bring you this video. And if you enjoy our brand of telling you audio dramas, then consider subscribing to the channel, because that will allow you to partake in the Crisis on Infinite Earths. And if you hit that like button, there's a chance you'll be hit with gamma radiation and become the Hulk. It's a chance, it's slim. Either way, I hope you guys enjoy this video, and I'll see you at the ending. In the beginning, there was only black, a darkness so complete that even burning light could do nothing to pierce it. But finally, the light grew, and the darkness receded. In that moment, the multiverse was born, shuddering and vibrating with small changes. What should have been one world became many. But now, a hooded figure stands and watches as a white wave of negative energy cascades over the earth. He watches as people run in fear as the wave erases all before them. Yet, there is no running, and they are swallowed up by the nothingness. As they run, he pushes past them. For as they run from the end, he is drawn to it, forced to watch the death rattle of the multiverse. And he reaches for the sea of nothing. Let me die alone with it! He curses, but no, he has already begun to disappear once more. Earth 3, a world that will soon reach its end. Powering, a member of the crime syndicate, tries to use up all of his power to stop the volcanoes from erupting and destroying within their patches. No use, Ultraman. My ring won't seal these volcanoes fast enough. Nature's gone insane, he calls to his comrade, but Ultraman already knows. It's more than nature. It's the whole universe. I've used my telescopic vision and we're the only world that remains. Ultraman flies down, trying to place a barrier between the city and the paths of the lava flow. Once, they terrorized this world, but now the crime syndicate is fighting to save it. Elsewhere, Johnny Quick and Owlman watch as a wave of endless nothing crawls towards them. Beachgoers running in fear. We're gonna die like the rest of them, Owlman tells his friend, and Johnny's eyes widen in fear. Over in Metropolis, Lex Luthor flies through the air, watching as the wave of nothing is destroying the very city itself. With my powers, I can't save them. I feel so useless. He whispers, and he sees one of his enemies, Superwoman, trying to stop the wave. He calls out to her, trying to aid her. But the woman is suddenly swallowed by a wave of antimatter. Gone. As if she never even existed. Though we battled time and time again, I never wanted her to die like that. He muses, and the hero streaks away, flying to his own headquarters. It's over, but if I am to perish, let it be at the side of my loving wife. He enters the base, finding his wife Lois with their young son. My love, it is only a matter of time, he tells her, sadness in his voice, tears filling his eyes as he draws her close. I can die peacefully, knowing that I'm with you, she tells him before looking down at their small child. But our son is so young, he has been cheated of living and knowing love. Must he perish as well? Luther releases his wife, beckoning for her to join him in the next room. And within the next chamber, he shows her a pod. The hooded figure then appears, listening as Lex explains that he has built this device to bridge the gap between dimensions. He takes his son, placing him into the pod. We will die, but our son shall live, he tells Lois. Outside, the wave of antimatter takes the lives of Johnny Quick and Owlman. Power Ring turning, sees the hooded figure. Who are you, man? He demands to know. I am Pharah, and I mourn for this world about to die. The hooded figure cries. Power Ring moves against him, certain that this is the being that is causing the trouble. But Pharah puts his head into his hands. No, mine is not the hand which slays the worlds. Now Ultraman turns, staring at the wave of antimatter. Then I guess this is it. He states simply, beginning to walk forward. Power Ring calls out to him, demanding to know what he is doing. What I have done my whole life, fighting to the very end. And Ultraman launches himself forward, flying into the wave of nothing. As the antimatter wave closes over everything, Lex pulls Lois in tight, holding her close. The pod begins to spin, going faster and faster as the wave is approaching them. My love, so the world ends, and our hopes and prayers live on. The pod suddenly leaps into the air in a shower of light, disappearing into the sky with Lois and Lex holding each other, kissing 
one last time as the earth is swallowed up and becomes no more. The pod continues to spin, vibrating through the dimensions, finally passing from one dead universe and into a living one, crashing against the Justice League watchtower of Earth-1. But the watchtower has been abandoned, and the baby sleeps fitfully within its pod. On his own watchtower, the being known as the Monitor watches as worlds are destroyed and universes are blinking out of existence. It begins again, Lila, he explains to his aide. The shudder of one universe ending, and the plaintive cry of another about to die. It is time, my dear, for us to act. It is July 1985, and the Monitor turns to the woman. I know what to do and whom to summon, he tells her. The woman nods, but questions the Monitor's decision. Why not both Supermans and Wonder Womans? Why not the most powerful of those that we have observed? She asks. The Monitor nods, explaining that he has watched the past, the present, the future, and he knows that the only way towards victory is through the heroes and villains fighting alongside each other, but he pauses, letting her know that another path has been made available. Lila, energized now, while I retrieve the infant sent here from Earth-3. She nods, and energy begins to surge around her, and the energy begins to swirl and transform her, and she becomes the being known as Harbinger. Streaking across time and space through the multiverse, she arrives in Gorilla City, appearing before King Solovar, and pulls him from reality. Then to the 31st century, where the legionnaire known as Dawnstar is taken. Then to Earth 2, 1942. The woman known as Firebrand is shocked as her world suddenly freezes and Harbinger appears, and with a touch, she is gone. In each of these worlds, shadows watch as these heroes and villains are taken and laughter echoes throughout the multiverse. Harbinger continues her mission, traveling to the distant past, searching for the Atlantean mage known as Orion. She is caught unaware as a dark shadow lashes out, piercing her body. Darkness fills her eyes and an evil smile pulls across her lips. She discovers the wizard, traveling through the city of the prehistoric Earth, and he rears back, attempting to defeat her with magic, but Harbinger uses her powers, destroying the ice beneath his feet. The wizard plummets, falling to his death until she pulls him from the multiverse. Yet she doesn't slow, arriving on Earth 2 to pull out Psycho Pirate from his cell within a mental institution. She then brings the villain to the present-day Earth 1, where they arrive to find Firestorm fighting against an evil killer Frost. They stop the battle with Psycho Pirate, transforming Frost's hatred for Firestorm into a feeling of love. Harbinger's mission comes to an end, and the team of heroes and villains are finally brought together on the Monitor's Watchtower. Those who have met in the past group together, discussing the idea that everything could possibly be ending, and others not as trusting of the villains that surround them. What could threaten both Earth 1 and 2? Superman questions Obsidian. You know everyone here? Some of these guys give me the spooks, the shadowy hero admits, and the villain known as Simon leans over the railing trying to warn the others of an impending attack. From the darkest corners of the room, the shadows suddenly seem to form and leap to destroy the powered beings, and some question how this could have even happened. Don't you see we've been set up? Harbinger lied to us, Superman tells them, and Jon Stewart leaps into action, blasting away the shadows, but the green light passes right through them. Superman punches away, calling for Obsidian to help them, and the Gorilla King Solovar leaps to the aid of Dawnstar, knocking away her own shadowy assailant. Don't be daydreaming, human! Don't you realize we've been caught in a way? He bellows. You're an ape who can talk? She questions. You're a human with wings. Reality holds surprises for everyone. The heroes continue to fight, and then some, such as Blue Beetle, discover that they could do little against these beings, while others, such as Obsidian and Orion, discover that their own powers work well against the creatures. All seems lost until a beaming light pierces the room, blinding all of those present and banishing the shadows from the chamber. And from one side, those gathered finally hear a voice. The attack was not planned, but it was also not unexpected. Please do not blame Harbinger, the Monitor tells them. He hits a switch and the lights dim, revealing him to all those who have gathered. Allow me to properly introduce myself. I am the Monitor. I have summoned you here because your universes are about to die. Earth 1. Darkness surrounds the mansion of the billionaire, Harold Standish. Inside, the Joker stands over the body of the man whose mouth has been twisted into a hideous grin. He laughs, placing the fedora on his head. With the billionaire dead, he now has the copyrights to the old movie reels that could be worth millions. The windows shatter inward as Batman leaps from the night, his cape bellowing like leathery bat wings. The Batman? You deciphered my clue! Amazing! Even I was stumped when I wrote it! <laughs> turning his pistol towards the hero. Batman lashes out, knocking the Joker to the ground, and he moves in, preparing to take him down. 
but the Joker sprays him with a flower on his chest, covering the caped crusader in a sticky goo. Getting to his feet, the Joker retrieves his gun, preparing to shoot the Dark Knight, when suddenly energy begins to spark around them and the Joker looks up to see the Flash struggling towards them. Help me! Someone! Anyone! Help! The Flash struggles and he groans, and the Joker aims his pistol, but a Batarang knocks it out of his hands as Batman frees himself. You're going back to Arkham where you belong, the Dark Knight tells him, but the Flash is still talking. So Batman turns away from his nemesis. Please, can't you see the world around me? It's dying all around me, the Flash says, and the Joker runs as Batman steps towards the Flash, horror in his eyes, as the Flash begins to disintegrate. Where are you, Flash? I can help you, Batman tells his friend as he disappears before him. The world is dying. Save us. Save us. Save us. He moans and is suddenly gone. Dear God, what is happening? Batman asks, stunned. Back at the Monitor space station, the 15 beings that he has summoned stand before him. Already, more than 1,000 universes have perished, he explains to them. He then shows them images of the antimatter wave washing over the entire universe. First, your world will feel nature's wrath as your planets cry out in agony. Then shall come the nothingness, sweeping across your worlds, taking with it everything. Firestorm steps forward, accusing the Monitor of selling weapons to supervillains within their world. Superman of Earth 2 tries to quiet the growing anger towards the being. I've heard of this Monitor too. I suggest we hear him out. He explains, bringing the group to a silence. The Monitor sighs, taking his seat as a wave of exhaustion overtakes him. If he's telling the truth, we'll save our worlds. If he's lying, no power exists that can defeat us all. Superman explains, and the Monitor looks out at the group as they wait for his explanation. Understand I am linked to all positive matter. It flows through me and gives me power. But as the antimatter destroys more and more, I weaken. Soon, if you fail, I will be helpless to prevent my foe from destroying all that exists. I've tested all of you, and more. Pitted you against one another to fully catalog your abilities. You are my initial force. Others will be summoned as their abilities are required. A grumble of dissent moves through the room, with some still showing distrust towards the monitor. Why do you argue? Harbinger asks, stepping back into the room. Pledge your aid to the Monitor. She explains that the Monitor has planted devices within five crucial eras throughout time that will halt the antimatter tide. Five eras will coincide with the existence of heroes such as yourself, for the presence of heroic ideals creates its own focal points. You must protect them from our enemies. Then you must engage them on our command. Orion looks on as Harbinger is speaking, sensing a great darkness within her. The Monitor is weak. What is your answer? Speak! Superman steps forward, speaking for the group. We'll help, and we'll know soon enough if it's all true. What are these places that you're sending us to? Blue Beetle asks. As an answer, Harbinger uses her powers once more, and the room is filled with the energy as the group is separated, scattered to the different corners of the multiverse itself. On his watchtower, Harbinger tells Monitor that he can rest now to conserve his strength. And a single tear forms in her eyes. She knows that she cannot resist the darkness that is calling to her. She's forced to obey his commands, and soon, she will betray the Monitor. Our Earth-1 Superman arrives on the rooftop of the Daily Planet where Batman has summoned him. The Cage Crusader explains to Superman what he saw when the Flash appeared to him. Praise heaven! Help at last! Farrah yells, startling the two men as he appears on the rooftop with them. Who are you? Superman asks. I am called Farrah. I need you, both of you. Your legends reached my world long before my exile. It's your world and your universe. Your Earth is dying, as have the other Earths before. He begins to explain, but the two heroes look on stunned as Farah begins to fade from their reality. No, 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 I'm being called away! I cannot resist! Help! He screams before disappearing, and in the far future, the last boy on Earth, Commandy, climbs the strange golden tower that has appeared in his world. The Earth is destroyed around him, and the remains of the Statue of Liberty rest in the waters behind him. He pulls himself upward by a vine, but from the golden tower, a strange shadow creature appears, cutting the rope above him. I'm done for! The boy cries as he plummets back to Earth, and a strong arm reaches out, taking his hand. Not quite, lad. Superman smiles at him. You're safe in my hands. The Man of Steel brings the boy back to the tower as Dawnstar and Solovar continue to climb it. Boy, when did it appear? Is there more than one? Solovar growls, and Commandy stares at the talking gorilla, believing him to be one of the killers of his world. Happily, boy, I am no such thing. I am not even of your time period, Solovar explains. Commandy stares into the ape's eyes, seeing a kindness that he hasn't seen in any of the creatures of his own world. Dawnstar streaks by, attacking the shadow creatures that have reappeared. They don't seem as strong here as they did on Monitor's ship, she tells them. 
Superman agrees, easily dropping another with his heat vision. One of the monsters grasps Commandy, burning the boy's shoulder where they touched him. But Solovar is there protecting him. The shadows put up less of a fight this time, quickly fleeing from the gathering heroes. Dawnstar wishes to pursue, but Solovar disagrees, making sure the Commandy is safe. We were brought here to protect the machine, not leave it alone for a second attack. He explains, and in the distance, Harbinger watches the heroes and laughs. Let them protect the machine. It will serve those fools no good. Their efforts will be rewarded with death. Later, on the monitor's watchtower, Harbinger enters the chamber where the young baby from Earth-3 is waiting. She is shocked, however, when she discovers that the infant is no more, and sitting in the chamber is now a young boy. In ancient Atlantis, Orion, Obsidian, and Psycho Pirate walk towards the city, another of the Golden Towers jutting from the center of the ancient metropolis. This is Atlantis? Obsidian questions? I've heard of it. I've seen it in movies, but nothing could have prepared me for what it's really like. Psycho Pirate smiles, feeling the emotions of all of the people housed within the city. Use your emotion controlling powers on them once, Psycho Pirate, and my punishment will be swift. They enter the city where the mage is welcomed by his subjects. And as he explains what happened to his guards, Obsidian appears at his shoulder. It's Psycho Pirate. Where is he? I can't find him anywhere. Outside the city, Pirate suddenly turns, feeling the power of raw terror. Behind him, Pharah appears. Where am I? I need to know! He exclaims. Atlantis, don't ask the year, Psycho Pirate explains. And Pharah seems distraught, so Psycho Pirate removes his mask, revealing his face with a smile. Pharah is shocked and suddenly begins to laugh, falling to the ground struggling when suddenly Psycho Pirate is knocked to the ground by a magical attack. He turns to see the angered mage walking towards him. Mistake, friends. Real mistake. You see, absorbing Purple Hair's emotions increased my strength. What you fools need is a healthy dose of terror! He snarls, lashing out with his powers, when suddenly those around Orion begin to suffer the feelings of abject terror coursing through their minds. Orion tries to defend himself with magic, but he can't stop the feelings that fill him. Obsidian leaps forward, clocking the mage in his shadows. The madness fades. Thank you, Obsidian. Orion tells him, and Psycho Pirate stands, power filling him, but suddenly there's a spark of energy and he disappears. The villain lays in a realm of complete darkness now, away from the battle, away from Orion and Obsidian. What happened? Where am I? Psycho Pirate, I need you. A voice growls in the black. The pirate looks around, seeing nothing. Show me your face and I'll teach you the meaning of terror. He shouts, but the man's face suddenly disappears, becoming nothing more than smooth skin. Fool! You want a face without one of your own? You want to scream, don't you? Well, you cannot, not without a mouth. The man's face suddenly reappears though and he struggles back to his feet. If you wish to live, let me know. But to live, you must serve as I demand. Your answer, now! Back at Atlantis, Orion Obsidian questioned the man known as Pharah. He explains that he was exiled from his world and is cursed to watch as each multiverse is destroyed one by one. Before he could explain further, one of the Atlanteans points to the sky where a growing wave of nothingness is sweeping towards them. I am sorry, Pharaoh tells them, but it begins anew. In a matter of hours, your Earth will die. On his watchtower, Harbinger watches as Monitor searches for an empath to replace the lost Psycho Pirate. Though she stares, a voice fills her mind and she finds herself in the black room. The shadowy figure tells her that the monitor will fail, that his strength grows as the monitor weakens. He turns, ordering her to leave. Work must be done. On board the monitor satellite, the being is studying the former child known as Alex Luther. Astounding. I've never seen the likes of your kind before, he explains. In the space of days, you have aged from infancy to adolescence. Yet you, child of Earth-3, are remarkable for reasons far beyond your rapid aging. The boy questions why the monitor continues to test him, and the being explains that he is filled with both positive and negative energy. I feel you are the key to the terror at hand, for you somehow bridge this universe and the universe which threatens to swallow us all. But the boy questions what would happen if he cannot help the monitor in his quest. The being, the cosmic being is silent, for he has no answer to this question. And behind him, Harbinger enters the room asking if monitor needs help with anything, but he is silent. Does he know? Harbinger questions herself. Does the Monitor know that she will betray him to his greatest enemy? She moves through the station, but her mind is once again returned to the dark room of her master. I have news of the Monitor, she informs him. Good, good. The Master will hear you, Psycho Pirate tells her, smiling at her, sensing her fear of him. Away from me, Psycho Pirate. I am not here for you, she snaps at the villain. And from the shadows, her master speaks. Silence, Psycho Pirate. 
Your meaningless prattle annoys me. The being's icy voice calls out to him. Harbinger, I know why you are here indeed. I know all as soon as the monitor himself thinks it. Destroy the Luther child. The dead can present no threat to us. Now go, do as I command, he orders her. And in the future of Earth-1, the Flash is running as fast as he can, trying to save as many lives as possible. The Earth has gone crazy with volcanoes opening up in the cities as winds tear through the buildings. He's knocked to his feet, tumbling to the ground, and he looks up in terror as he sees a growing wave of antimatter swallowing everything before it. What is that? He exclaims, but the speedster knows that he has one chance, and he begins to alter the vibration of his body, fading out of existence. In July of 1985, the Teen Titans look up the growing wave of antimatter as it swallows the city around them. Nightwing screeches to a halt on his motorcycle, calling out orders to his team, and he orders the others to rally, to hold down the panic of the civilians. The heroes combine their efforts and they save some of the falling buildings, but it's just not enough. Meanwhile, in the sky, Starfire is blasting away at the antimatter field, only to discover it's having no effect. It's no use! My star bolts are absorbed by whatever that is, she tells the team. As another building begins to crumble, Wonder Girl begins to lower people down to the ground with her lasso. And from the ground, Nightwing watches as another building begins to fall behind her. He calls out to his teammate, but she can't hear him over the chaos. And at the last second, a blur suddenly arrives, pushing Donna to the floor. Sorry to push you down like that, Wonder Girl, but I had no choice. Superman tells her as he stands up, brushing himself off. You okay? On the ground, Batman joins the group of Titans and Outsiders. Something's out there. We don't know how much time we have left. Batman informs them. The heroes gather together and Katana is suddenly shocked, pointing behind Batman. Not again. This time it's not merely an image. Batman exclaims as he sees the Flash standing before him. Batman, thank heavens. Something is happening in the future. Everything is unraveling at the seams. Batman tries to get the Flash to calm down, but the same thing as before happens. I have to speak to you. But the Flash pauses as a strange feeling begins to overtake his body. Batman moves forward, believing that he can pull the Flash free of the glow around his body. I've got to stop this before the image I saw comes true. But Jericho, son of Deathstroke, leaps forward, knocking the Dark Knight aside before he can touch the Flash. The heroes watch in horror as the speedster seems to stretch before them, fading into existence, his screams of help echoing around them. And in deep space... The living computer known as Brainiac sits within his command chair, watching as the antimatter wave swallows up all before him. He knows that he cannot remain here or he will be destroyed. His ship turns, rocketing through the vastness of space. I need assistance on Earth. Only the one called Luther can help me now, he notes. In 1944, Markovia, the snow falls from the skies as the Nazis move through the city, bombs exploding and gunfire rattling over the destroyed ruins. But the people do not fight alone, and Sergeant Rock and his howling commandos begin to sweep through the city, their weapons sighted on the soldiers of the Third Reich. One of the men look up, startled by the appearance of a golden tower in the middle of the city, and Sergeant Rock's men look up, surprised to find Dr. Polaris and Geoforce flying above them. By the magnetic stream, the Monitor sent us to World War II, Dr. Polaris cries. But anger fills Geoforce. My home country lies below, Markovia! The Nazis slaughtered my people. Perhaps now I can get some payback, he yells. The two costumed heroes begin to attack the German soldiers as Sergeant Rock looks on. Rock, this war is crazy or something, Wild Man asks. It's always been crazy. Now it's for the record books, Rock confirms. And above them, Ted Cord is flying in his airship, the Bug, watching his friends. But he knows that the fighting isn't why they were sent here. Below, the Nazis have begun to take cover around the Golden Tower, but the commandos, allied with the costumed fighters, launch an assault. Come on! Let's hit him hard! Rock yells, firing his Thompson as he runs forward. Reaching the tower, one of the commandos begins to climb the strange metal, but one of the shadow creatures then emerges, taking the man's arms, and he screams, drawing the attention of the rest of the commandos. Stay back, soldiers! Let me deal with this! Geoforce tells them. Like hell, mister! This war's for soldiers! Now mystery men like you all-star heroes. Rock growls at him, and the group rounds the corner, discovering the men being killed by the shadow creatures. Move it, easy company! Now! Rock yells, and his men open fire on the monsters. The shadows all move in, disintegrating everything that they touch, and Rock's men begin to fall one by 
one. But up above, Blue Beetle lowers himself into the Golden Tower, unsure why the Monitor would think that he would be useful in this fight. Ted Kord is a scientist. Maybe my scientific expertise are needed, he wonders. And as the hero examines the machine, one of the shadow creatures lashes out, grasping him. He screams as pain is coursing through his body, but the monster suddenly explodes, and Beetle is stunned for a moment as he holds on. Of course, the scare of the original Blue Beetle gave me. He said it had mystical powers. But Beetle still looks in fear as the shadows begin to close in around him. He dodges, trying to tumble out of the way. Meanwhile, in his station, the Monitor watches as Cord is slipping and falling, plummeting towards the Earth. Despite his lack of powers, I was hoping Blue Beetle's Scarab would aid in my mission here. Unfortunately, that is not the case. His assistance is no longer required. Thus, I shall return him and the other wounded one to their time. In 1944, Blue Beetle suddenly disappears in a flash of energy. And in the far future, Superman, Dawnstar, Solovar, and Kamandi watch as the sky pulses angry in red. Dawnstar, is it wrong for a Superman to say that he's frightened? Solovar then aids Kamandi in fixing his wounds, but the ape suddenly collapses from his own wounds. The last boy on Earth cradles him, telling his new friend not to die. Don't leave me, he cries, but Solovar looks on with sadness. I have no choice, lad. Be good, he whispers. The others watch as the great King Solovar disappears in a flash of energy. And throughout time, the heroes fight to protect the Monitor's devices. Despite their efforts, the antimatter wave continues forward, destroying everything before it. All while the Monitor is watching from his satellite. He moves quicker than I expected. Instead of days, we only have hours. The Earths are doomed, the Monitor exclaims. No, it is time to activate your machines. But a voice suddenly calls out from behind him. And it's time for you to die! Harbinger cries as the monitor turns. July, 1985. The red skies have given way to electrical storms and snow sweeping from it. Supergirl flies through the air, brought to the city by a call from Barbara Gordon, who floats above and in the distance. And that's when the two heroes can see the wave of nothingness moving forward. They sit and talk with Batgirl frightened by the end that draws near. I feel so useless, helpless, worthless, so very scared. Batgirl tells her tears in her eyes. Supergirl nods, looking out over the waves. I'm scared too, but I can't let that stop me from doing what I have to do, she tells her. And in the distance, the two watch as a plane begins to break up with the pilot falling towards the antimatter wave. Supergirl leaps into action, saving the pilot at the last second, and Batgirl wonders how her friend can think of saving others at a time like this. When I could only think of myself, what will I become? Batgirl questions. Meanwhile, over on the monitor satellite, he sits back in his chair, aware that his enemy is close. With the death of Earth-1, he shall gain even more power. Then, none will be powerful enough to stop him. But there's one chance. My new warrior. He cries as he flips a few switches. An ion beam rips through the cosmos, aiming for an unstable star in the Vega system. The beam strikes the star, causing it to ripple and shoot back outwards. And in Japan, a young scientist named Dr. Hoshi looks up into the night sky, and using the strange antimatter wave's destruction of physics to see far beyond the galaxy, her eyes widen in shock as she sees the ion beam coming towards Earth. In a split second, it makes contact, destroying the lab around her. The monitor watches as the other scientists are shocked to find the lab destroyed and the young woman is now gone. And meanwhile, while this is going on, in his darkened lair, our enemy is watching the hero known as Red Tornado. One of the most powerful members of the Justice League. He waves his hand and the hero appears in the dark chamber. Hiya, robot. Or are you an android? A cyborg, maybe? I can never remember, Psycho Pirate says in a greeting. Red Tornado turns to the villains, demanding to know where he is, and if they are the ones responsible for what is happening to the Earth. More than just your Earth, Android. Come now. We have a universe to destroy. Now across time and two Earths, the heroes are continuing their battle. But their efforts are in vain as the shadow beings begin to combine, growing stronger. It happens in every era, across both worlds. In 1985, another golden tower appears. Starfire moves towards it, wishing to destroy it in hopes that it will stop the calamity. But the woman once known as Hoshi appears, now as the new Dr. Light. You stupid Koreans! You don't realize what you're doing! She yells, and she orders them to get back. It's all that could save the planet. Starfire is shocked as the woman's words are in Japanese. And Superman tells her that the new Dr. Light seems to be defending the machine. 
Dr. Light lashes out with her new powers, crying for them to get back, and Starfire and Halo are knocked away, momentarily blinded. Superman flies in, speaking to Dr. Light in Japanese, trying to understand what is happening. The antimatter sweeps through our universe, and only I can save us. Do you understand? She asks. Above, the monitor watches as the wave sweeps across the Earth. This is happening all too fast. He saps my strength with each universe that dies. He whispers. And though all of my warriors fight valiantly, all is not ready. I, Harbinger, the child of Luther and Farah, are all that stand between. But the monitor stops sensing the arrival of his ally. Farah appears shock on his face as he looks around. Greetings, Farah. I have been awaiting your arrival, the monitor tells him. And Farah stares at the monitor's home in awe as he explains the situation. I was the one responsible for your survival. You should have died for your sins. The Monitor explains. Anger flashes through Farrah as he demands to know why the Monitor would curse him. I have sacrificed much of my own life so that you would live. You should be grateful. The Monitor shows Farrah the images of his machines and even as the heroes are fighting to defend them. The worlds are separated by vibration and time. My machines will bring them together. As the two watch on, Farrah informs the Monitor that the heroes can't win. Even now, they are fighting a losing battle across all time and space. These worlds will die, Monitor. Like all the others, I have been forced to watch die. But the Monitor knows how this will end and asks only that Farah not harm the girl until all is made clear. Harm who? Who are you talking about? Too late, you old fool! Harbinger yells from behind them and Monitor turns to see his former ally. I have been waiting for you. An energy blast courses from the woman hitting the Monitor. He commands me now, Monitor! And his command is death! She screams, and with this done, the Harbinger plummets from the walkway but Farrah watching as she disappears. He runs back to the being, begging the monitor to explain everything to him. Tell me what to do. Tell me how to activate the machines, he cries. But the monitor is now gone. Farrah cries over his body. Hope is lost and tears fall from his eyes across time and space of both worlds. The antimatter wave is now pushing forward and the heroes watch, unable to do anything as both of their worlds fade into nothing and they have failed. It is done. The first two prime universes are gone. But why has my strength not increased? The dark voice of ice calls into his chamber. The monitor is dead, yet his energies have not flowed into me. Two universes are gone, yet I have not received their power. Psycho Pirate steps forward, pleading with the voice. Please, tell me what's going on. I can help. Haven't I controlled our two captives? You haven't told me. Why do we need them? You have me. You are rapidly outlasting your welcome here, pirate. Even your powers can be replaced. The voice growls, but back at the monitor station, Pariah stands over the body. He looks up startled to find a woman known as Lila sitting nearby. Tell me it's not true, she begs. I killed him, didn't I? I had this nightmare that I did, but I wouldn't do it, not unless I was being controlled. Pariah stands, shaking the woman, trying to make sense of what she is saying, when suddenly the monitor's voice echoes through the chamber, stunning them both. Lila, if you can hear me, do not grieve over what you have done. They both turn, seeing an image of the monitor's face playing on a screen. I was aware of your possession. I knew that it was going to occur. You had no choice but to slay me, Lila. But by doing so, you have fulfilled my last request. My body died, yet my essence lived on. Killing me, Lila, released all of my energy. Energy which more than just powered my vibrational forks. They stare at the monitor as he explains that from his death was a netherverse that was created that now houses both Earth 1 and 2. In my haste to save the world, all time has become one. The vibrations which separate the universes are slowing down, merging. And when they occupy the same space at the same time, they will destroy each other. The monitor's last message ends and Lila leans over the body, tears falling from her eyes as she tells him that she loved him. He knew it, Lila, and he loved you. Alex tells her, entering the room in golden armor. They question who the man is as Lila last saw him as a young boy. He left me with instructions on how to save the world and those about to die. Alexander explains and in the darkness, the icy voice calls out in anger. Damn him! Now I know what he did. But that fool, in dying, only delayed the inevitable. I'll have those worlds yet. And there are still others to conquer before then. Psycho Pirate demands to know when he will get what he was promised. For now, you may play with our human guest if you wish. Just do not slay him. The voice commands and the villain turns with a smile, seeing the Flash standing before him. Why am I here? 
What's going on? I want answers! The Flash demands, and the pirate turns to him, beating the Flash with the emotion of terror. The hero falls to the ground, struggling to get away as fear begins to fill his body. Silver hurt me! He screams out, and throughout the world, news reports come in from all over the past, present, and future that they have all come together. Dinosaurs are rampaging through the city as biplanes and spaceships fly overhead. Ancient temples now sit next to futuristic skyscrapers, while World War II soldiers stare stunned at pilgrims. The heroes of Earth are suddenly teleported to the Monitor satellite, where Harbinger urges them to help aid her in saving the two worlds. Alexander Luther and Pariah aid her as the heroes look up in the crowded room. Harbinger, you called this here once before and look what happened. You lied to us. The World War II hero Firebrand shouts up. Some of the heroes grumble and they join in the dissension, but Superman steps forward. I've heard of this Monitor, and it's obvious that something wrong is happening. I'm listening. The Man of Steel tells the room. So am I. If the world is at stake, Wonder Woman stands ready. Diana joins in. We need your help now more than ever. The Monitor is dead. I only know some of what has happened, Alexander explains. He tells them that their enemy seeks the destruction of all positive matter universes. That the universes are split into a multiverse at the beginning of time. To save all life, we must return to being one universe again. The heroes grumble within the chamber, unsure if they should aid these beings in their mission. Return to your worlds, see for yourselves the danger. But decide quickly. There is little time before the final universes perish and before we could save all of what's left of ours. He tells them and the heroes stare in silence for a moment before Earth 2 Superman steps back forward. Maybe I'm wrong talking for everyone, Pariah, but I will. Send us back, let the doubters decide. But I promise you this, if we can save the worlds that remain, we will. Meanwhile, in deep space, a ship lands on the planet Oa and members of the Green Lantern Corps begin to disembark, eager to learn why their rings have stopped functioning. They push forward to the central battery only to discover that the Guardians float, trapped in a form of stasis. Back on Earth, people are dealing with all of time merging. Superman saves Lois from a saber-toothed tiger before introducing her to his Earth-2 counterpart. Alfred calls the Bat family to the Wayne Manor to show them the Bear Tribe cavemen that have appeared inside. In the enemy's dark lair, though, Flash looks on as Red Tornado seems to be tortured. Please, I don't know what you did to me, but please leave him alone, he begs. Fear still gripping his body, but the voice laughs, explaining that Red Tornado is not man nor machine, but instead a primal force of nature. I am changing him into what he was meant to be. Never again will he be the Red Tornado you once knew. On Earth, the confusion continues, with people seeing loved ones that passed away long ago. Members of the Legion of Superheroes seeing ghostly images of heroes from Earth 2, some they recognize while others are a complete mystery. And finally, the destruction is too much for the heroes to aid, and they call Alexander Luther, Harbinger, and Pariah, the Justice Society, the Justice League, the Heroes of Atlantis, the Titans and the Metal Men, Batman and the Outsiders, the Legion of Superheroes. Both Supermen now look at each other and they nod, making the call. Heroes, villains, survivors, they will all come together. It is the only way to save the Earth. Back at the station, Alexander explains to his first group of heroes that they must save the last remaining five universes that have enough power to stop the enemy. He's about to send them through the vortex when Pariah interrupts him. I sense disaster, he yells, and the satellite begins to shake and tremble, with energy swirling around it, threatening to rip it apart. We gotta get off this thing, Hawkman yells. No, I still have a mission to perform, Alexander responds, and in the darkened lair, the enemy and Psycho Pirate watch the satellite rip itself apart. This will merely delay my enemies. The icy voice intones, not prevent them from resisting me. You talk big, mister, but I haven't seen you do anything to prove yourself, the Flash tells him, struggling to his feet as he begins to shake off the effects of the Psycho Pirate. Your emotion controlling dupe can't hold me down. Why do you keep hiding yourself? What are you afraid of? Show yourself! The being turns. Flash, you are a fool if you believe you could beat me. I am not motivated by mere emotion. If you wish to see me, I have no reason that I should deny you that privilege. The light flashes, revealing an armored being, a mask covering his face, which reveals the dead skin around his jaw, his eyes glowing with strange energy as he speaks. Greetings, Flash. I hope the anticipation was worth it. Call me the Monitor. The Monitor stands over the fallen Flash, who continues to struggle against the effects of the Psycho Pirate's power. The Monitor is dead. Now his satellite and his super-powered champion shall die before me. The being calling himself the Monitor cries out. Psycho Pirate begs the being to grant him the power to control the world, as he was promised. And finally, the Monitor brings him close. 
and in the villain's eyes, he can see the final three universes. I now grant your wish. There are three Earths left for me to conquer. My foes' champions were just sent there to save those worlds. You shall use your emotion-controlling powers to win me the final victory, the Monitor tells him. Within the Monitor's satellite, the heroes cling to the destruction as the vessel tears itself apart. Alexander yells at them. The shields will protect us until the mission is done. All of you, hurry! Throughout the satellite, Alexander is calling to all of the other heroes, urging them not to abandon the vessel. There is nothing outside but limbo, he tells them. Amidst the chaos of the ship destroying itself, Pariah begins to scream. What is happening? Starfire asks, flying to the man's aid. I'm disappearing again, and that means that there is greater danger elsewhere, he tells her. Alexander steps into the Monitor's machines, knowing that he must use his negative and positive energy to draw the last three Earths into the Netherverse. But Harbinger appears before him, unwilling to let another die after she destroyed the Monitor. Alexander falls, knocked unconscious by one of the woman's blasts. I'm sorry, Alex. I must do this. She tells him as he falls to the floor and she leaps into the air, flying through the ship in a blaze of energy. The heroes watch as she passes, flying into the core. Her powers are different though, created by the monitor. And in the core of the satellite, she finds her mechanical womb where her earthly body awaits. Energy coursing out of the woman as she makes contact. The satellite explodes in a shower of debris, destroyed forever. And back on Earth-1, Lex Luthor is caught in a vast storm, but suddenly he is saved, beamed aboard the ship known as Brainiac. Where am I? Who are you? Tell me, robot! He demands, and the living computer orders the billionaire to be silent. I offer you now a plan calculated to make both of us the rulers of this universe, the robot offers him. On the world known as Earth-X, the antimatter wave continues to swallow all before it. There's a flash as suddenly a team of heroes appears on the nearby rooftop. What happened? Where are we? One asks. Obviously, on Earth. It's the crux of the crisis. But which Earth? Hawkman asks. The group looks around, startled to find an image of Harbinger floating in the white wave of nothingness before them. That's not what's bothering me, gang. Northwind tells them, looking down at the streets. A group of civilians is running through the streets, headed straight for the antimatter wave. He swoops in, trying to stop them, but the crowd doesn't seem to see him, their eyes glassy with fear. It's as if they're being controlled, but the hero is stunned as the group known as the Freedom Fighters appear, knocking him down. The crowd begins to hammer on the hero, throwing him to the earth, with Hawkman swooping in to help, but he's knocked out of the sky as Black Condor lashes out at him. Villain! You and your friends are the cause of this insanity! We'll kill you! He screams. Starfire leaps to help, blasting the other hero with her energy beams, while meanwhile, Dr. Light creates a wall to block the crowd of civilians from running to their deaths. And the antimatter universe, a psycho pirate, glows with his new power, his face showing pain as he speaks to his new master. Monitor, it hurts. So many emotions. I feel like my head is going to explode. Please let me stop. Nonsense, psycho pirate. You wanted a world to control. Now you have three. The heroes appear on Earth-4, finding themselves attacked by another group of heroes, acting out of terror that seems to grip them. And on Earth-5, Supergirl, Beast Boy, Black Canary, and Wonder Woman find themselves fighting against the Shazam family. The heroes continue to fight across all of the worlds, but suddenly, they are all stunned as the Earths begin to shake beneath their feet. They watch as the images of Harbinger in the antimatter wave raises her arms, and the Earths are drawn from the antimatter cloud that cuts through them, drawn from certain death, drawn through the focus of the Harbinger. In his master's lair, Psycho Pirate suddenly opens up his eyes. I was controlling all of their emotions. All of my power was focused. Billions of souls crying out. No! Harbinger draws the other worlds into the netherverse, joining Earths 1 and 2. And then she focuses her powers, saving these worlds, her body suddenly glowing brightly, and suddenly it is no more. Lila opens up her eyes, startled as she looks around to see Alexander Luther sitting with her, both laying on a chunk of rock, floating through the netherverse. Are they saved? Did I do it? She asks. Harbinger is no more. You sacrificed everything to save those universes, Alex tells her. They both look down at the floating universes below them. They both know that there is still work to be done. Now five worlds are slowly merging together, Lila whispers into the void. And finally, Alex looks around at the vast netherverse around them and the lone rock that they stand on. So there's only one other question. How do we get off this floating rock? The beings known as Lila, Alex, and Pariah sit floating on a hunk of rock within the netherverse. And finally, it's time for them to explain to the heroes of the five remaining Earths what led to the possible destruction of the multiverse. Soon, they have gathered together a small group of heroes, and Alexander stands before them. You have come here for answers, and I will give it to you now. It's the beginning of all that has happened, and knowledge may bring about its end. Lila steps forward, her robes flowing around her. 
Our current crisis began 10 billion years ago. The Earth was little more than cooling gases. The crisis began in a world called Oa, a world of immortals and limitless hope. Lila tells the heroes that the Owens, who possessed mental powers unheard of in history, continue to strive forward, continuing to try and better themselves and the universe. One of their scientists, known as Krona, sought to learn the origins of the universe itself, despite the council ordering him to stop. Krona continued forward, using his machine to peer into the mysteries of the universe. A cosmic bolt exploded through his machine, causing the universe itself to shudder. From this, the evil antimatter universe and the multiverse was born. Because of Corona's evil creation, the Owens created the Green Lantern core out of atonement, and the antimatter universe on the moon of Quard, the double of Oa, an evil life was born. The Anti-Monitor was born. He grew powerful, conquering the world of Quard, and created his own army of Thunderers, the most powerful of which became the Shadow Demons. But the Anti-Monitor was not alone, and on the moon of Oa, the Monitor was born as well. The two beings sensed each other and they lashed out. The attack disabled them both, placing them into a cosmic slumber. I've heard of Quard, but never knew its origins. The Superman of Earth 2 interrupts. What freed the Anti-Monitor? Pariah steps forward to tell his story. On his world, he was a great scientist who learned that the antimatter universe and the multiverse were real. He wished to learn of their secrets, and so he built a great machine. He stepped into the antimatter chamber, and he watched the creation of the universe. But his world was consumed by the antimatter wave created by his machine, and it destroyed all life. He cries for his sins, but Lila informs him that this is also what awoke the monitor, which might allow existence to be saved. And you? How do you fit into this? Superman asks Lila. Tears fill the woman's eyes as she explains that the Monitor saved her life when she was just a child and he raised her. And I paid him back by killing him. With their story told, the cosmic beings gathered together the strongest heroes of the remaining Earths for an assault into the antimatter universe. They stand ready with Pariah as their guide as Alexander Luther prepares to open up a wormhole for them. The young man begins to glow as the heroes look on and energy cracks as the portal is open. Go now! I don't know how long I can hold it open, Alexander tells them, and the heroes leap forward, passing through the barrier. Finally, they pass through and are greeted by the Anti-Monitor's great stone fortress, floating in the vast void. Inside, the Anti-Monitor watches the approach of Earth's mightiest heroes. He turns, ordering Psycho Pirate to control the heroes with his powers. But the man stutters, fear playing on his own face. Monitor, you used me to control these worlds. It will take me time to recharge. I can't do anything now. The Anti-Monitor knocks the villain aside, screaming his anger. Very well. I must take matters into my own hands. Elsewhere in the fortress, Pariah continues to lead the heroes forward, sensing the evil of the Anti-Monitor. Suddenly, the stone statues begin to come alive, lashing out against the heroes. One of them knocking Superman of Earth 2 to the ground, and the Kryptonian is surprised to see blood spilling out of his nose. The heroes spread out, locked in battle. Some powers do not work as they should, and the Kryptonians find themselves weakened by the antimatter universe. As the heroes continue to fight, Superman pushes forward, sensing that Pariah and Dr. Light will need him to defeat the Anti-Monitor. But Pariah is knocked down by the shifting fortress, and Dr. Light pushes onward, angered by the situation. Superman catches up with her, and the two enter into a vast chamber. Within, they find the machine that the Anti-Monitor is using to merge the Earths. This is the machine I've got to destroy. With it eliminated, the Earths won't merge and they won't destroy each other. Superman says stepping forward, but the darkness shifts and the Anti-Monitor emerges, attacking the Man of Steel. In the distance, Supergirl can hear her cousin screams of pain and she rushes forward to aid him. The Anti-Monitor raining blow after blow on Superman, drawing blood, knocking him to the ground. But suddenly, Supergirl is there, hammering the villain in his armor. Blow after blow cracks the being's armor until the antimatter energy begins to leak outwards, and he knocks her aside, struggling to his feet. You have destroyed my body. I feel my energies waning. He snarls. As the antimatter energy pulses off the villain, Supergirl struggles to get over to Superman and Dr. Light. Her cousin still laying unconscious, Supergirl orders Dr. Light to take him out of the chamber. When Kara makes her move, she turns, launching herself at the Anti-Monitor, the two locking in battle, exchanging blows. She slams him into the machine, destroying it, but with all of her power. Supergirl, she's no match for the Anti-Monitor. Superman sits up just in time to see the energy blast piercing his cousin, and he screams out her name, Kara! With his shell destroyed, the Anti-Monitor knows that he can remain, and he launches himself out of the fortress into the void. But he warns them as he departs, it's not over yet. I shall stand triumphant at the dawn of time.
outside the fortress begins to crumble around the heroes, ending the battle with the stone giants. And the heroes gather as Superman holds Kara's body in his arms, her last breath escaping her lips. He screams into the void, tears streaming down his eyes. It's not fair! Where is the Anti-Monitor? I will kill him for this! He screams, but Earth 2 Superman is there, telling the young man not to let his hunger for revenge ruin the chance that Kara gave them. The heroes gather as the fortress begins to fall apart. With Pariah as their guide, they fly out once more into the Antimatter universe. Emerging back into the Netherverse, the heroes return to their respective Earths. The merging of the five Earths has been stopped. They are not fully merged nor separate. For now, life continues as if nothing happened. Such peace will not remain for long. On board a vessel that launched away from the Anti-Monitor's fortress, Psycho Pirate stands, gazing out of the antimatter energy, the body of the Flash hanging above him. He fears for his life since he failed the Anti-Monitor, but now he can only hope that the being is officially dead. That will not save you, Psycho Pirate. Anti-Monitor warns, stepping out of the antimatter energy to stand aboard the strange ship. He has re-solidified, looking different than he did before. Supergirl destroyed my outer shell. She almost destroyed me. It took time to construct a new presence around me, but I am ready now. We will land on Kward, and from there we will destroy the remaining Earths. We? You're not killing me? Psycho Pirate asks, but the Anti-Monitor tells him that he still requires his talents. Later, the being stands on Kward, watching as his slaves build a mighty antimatter cannon that will obliterate the five remaining Earths. His thunderers work the slaves hard, using their awesome powers to destroy those who slow down the construction. Now, feeling at his full strength again, Psycho Pirate moves through the fortress, and he enters the room where the Flash is hanging, stuck in a constraining gel. Scared, speedster? If you aren't, you soon will be. <laughs> but Flash slowly opens his eyes, looking at the villain. Psycho Pirate? Eat Jello! He yells, spinning quickly, launching the gel across the room. He moves fast, cracking the pirate across the jaw, knocking him back. Maybe your powers have returned, but so am mine. I've been slowly increasing my inner vibrations until I could simply slip through your gelatin jail. The Flash moves around the room in a blur, knocking out his Thunderer guard. He then turns back, and the Psycho Pirate tries to use his powers to slow the Flash, to make the hero feel fear. But Barry pushes through it, launching forward, beating the villain senseless. Psycho Pirate finally holds up his hands, his face bruised and bloody. Please, stop! I'll do anything you want! He stutters, and Barry looks at him, sweat dripping from his face. Pirate, you're gonna love this one. Within the fortress, the Thunderers continue to work the slaves, when suddenly a blur appears and hate fills each of them one by one. They turn to the Anti-Monitor, feeling hate towards their master, and they launch their lightning at him, trying to bring him down. The Anti-Monitor begins to fight as his forces are moving against him. The Flash finally stops, holding Psycho Pirate up. You're certain this is the Antimatter Cannon? Pirate nods, and the Flash knocks him out, moving forward fast, phasing through the shell of the Antimatter Cannon. He stops, shocked to find that the cannon is powered by concentrated antimatter. I can feel it, weakening me, draining my energy. He gasps, staggering, but the Flash can't be stopped. He knows that it is up to him to save the world, and he begins to run faster and faster, pushing past the weakened energy of the antimatter, and as he speeds up, the machine begins to break down around him. Energy is crackling, and it strikes out its own components. The cannon explodes, and still, the Flash runs faster. Have to keep running, no matter how much it hurts. The Flash gasps. I can feel the time stream all around me. He can feel the monitor beginning to open a temporal portal around him, but still, Barry pushes forward, when suddenly before him, he sees Wally West looking on in fear. My god, uh, I'm moving so fast, I'm going back in time! Barry thinks, with more images of the Flash before him, the Joker aiming a gun at him, and Batman trying to help him. Help! Somebody! Anybody! The Flash screams, and he runs faster and faster, his body beginning to fail around him, his skin shrinking away, and he begins to shrivel up. There's always hope! Time to save the world! Do what you have to! We have to save it! And with those last words, the Flash withers, and he dies. But in his last moments, the cannon explodes into a shower of destruction. 
The Anti-Monitor stands among that destruction, anger coursing through his body as he is defeated once again. And finally, he raises his arms and the energy flows around him. They will suffer for what they have done. They will suffer. My universe will provide the energy that I need. He bellows with the antimatter universe beginning to die, worlds perishing in an instance. With their deaths, the antimonitor grows more powerful. And with their deaths, I will be victorious. With the crisis momentarily averted, life returns to normal within the Earths that remain. The heroes fight villains across the realities, with the Legion of Doom trying to take over all Earths. Finally, though, a voice calls out, ordering the conflict to end, and the shade of the specter drifts over the remaining Earths. You must cease this mindless battle, for while you fight, the end of all universes is at hand. Hear the word of the specter, he calls. The villains and heroes across the world hear the voice of the specter, and he tells them, the Anti-Monitor still lives, and even now it seeks the destruction of all life. He has fled from this era, retreated to the past before life evolved, before the Earth was formed. He has traveled to the very dawn of time itself. No longer will there be positive matter, only antimatter will prevail. All Earths, all universes, all life will be eliminated. The heroes and villains of the Earth cease their fighting, joining forces once again to stop the destruction of all of existence. They say their goodbyes to their loved ones, not knowing if they will ever see them again. The Spectre has a plan to send the heroes to the dawn of time to stop the Anti-Monitor. When the villains arrive at the ancient Oa, there they will stop the creation of the multiverse in the Anti-Monitor himself. As they prepare to disembark, the heroes are suddenly interrupted as a new Superboy arrives. This is Superboy of Earth Prime, and the sole survivor of that destroyed world. Though some show hesitation, Superman of Earth-1 vouchers to the boy and with a nod, Spectre tells him, Very well, let's begin. With the combined powers of the greatest superheroes across five Earths, the team heads into the time stream. They emerge into nothingness, time before time, before thought, before creation. I have been waiting for your arrival. Indeed, I am disappointed that it has taken you this long to find me, the Anti-Monitor tells them, standing amongst the nothingness. He has massive now raw power from the destruction of the antimatter universe. Pariah, who has been brought to this point of danger, is trapped, suspended over them. He warns his friends to go back, but it is too late. It is now that the Anti-Monitor tells Pariah the truth, that he didn't destroy his world. Fool! You merely opened the antimatter portal to the dawn of time. I took advantage of your experiment, destroying those worlds to gain even more strength. The Anti-Monitor laughs soon he will have enough energy to rebuild the antimatter universe in his own image. Don't believe it, Monitor. As far as I'm concerned, you're already dead. Superman shouts and the heroes launch forward, hitting the Anti-Monitor with all of their power. They fly forward, lashing out against him with super strength and energy. Farther forward in time, though, the villains are launching their assault on Oa, trying to stop the experiment that would give birth to the crisis. At the dawn of time, the Anti-Monitor is flushed with power. You fools, I led you here to the dawn of time. I needed your life forces. I needed your energy. The heroes fall as he begins to siphon the energy out of them, absorbing it into himself. He waits for Krona to open the doors to the dawn of time, and then the course of history will change, and the antimatter universe will reign supreme. He pauses briefly. I feel a force resisting me. Who dares? The massive image of the specter appears, staying the anti-monitor's hand. I dare, cruel one, he snarls, grasping the villain's hand, and I will stop you. While the anti-monitor has absorbed the strength of the heroes, the specter has absorbed the energy of the magical beings of Earth. The two begin to fight for supremacy as Crona moves to open the portal to allow the controlling energy through, and the specter screams as he fights against the anti-monitor. He sees universes that never existed pass before his eyes, and then all of creation shatters, leaving nothing but death behind. In his apartment, Cal L of Earth 2 opens his eyes. Sitting up slowly, he shakes his head, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. What a horrible dream, he whispers, speaking into the empty room and thinking that Lois must have left for work early. I must have been really exhausted. I can't remember anything. He puts on his business suit and steps out into the city, heading for his job as the editor at the Daily Star. He reaches the building, climbing to the top floor where he sits at the desk in his big office. Great Caesar's ghost, who are you? Perry asks from the door of his office and the entire newsroom seemingly at his back. 
He points to his name on the door, asking why the elderly Clark would be sitting at his desk, since he is the editor of the Daily Planet. This is Earth One, Clark thinks, stunned to answer. There you are, Uncle Clark. Clark Kent of Earth One smiles, entering the office. He whispers to Perry that Uncle Clark is the man that he was named after, and he might just be a little confused. Quickly, both supermen head to the roof, where they try to figure out how Kal-El got to Earth One. The two supermen take off into the sky, flying towards the warp zone where the two Earths have begun to merge together. Along the way, Clark explains that the last thing that he remembers was also being at the dawn of time and then waking up back on Earth One. But they find out that the warp zone isn't there and no one has any idea what they're talking about. With no choice, the two heroes head to Central City, hoping to use the Flash's spare cosmic treadmill. They're shocked to find a sign that welcomes them to the twin cities of Central and Keystone, combining the two cities of the Flash from both Earth 1 and Earth 2. Say, I recognize that place. Jay and Joan Garrick live there. Earth 2 Superman notes, descending on the small house in the suburbs. Though he has known her for most of his career, Joan Garrick doesn't recognize Earth 2 Superman at all. I was wondering who Joan was talking to, Jay Garrick notes, coming out of the house to greet his friends. Kal-El steps forward asking if Jay actually recognized him. Of course I do, Clark. I know both of you, Jay tells him. And the three men step inside where they find Wally West working on the cosmic treadmill. The four heroes decide to use the treadmill to reach Earth 2 to figure out what is going on. How are the worlds merged? As they begin to run, the combined speed of the heroes allows them to pierce through the wall that separates the multiverse, energy cracking as they reach the other side, only to discover a dark void. What happened? Where's our world? Jay cries, almost falling off the treadmill in shock. Great Scott, there's nothing out there. No Earth 2, no universe, nothing. Earth 2 Superman yells, staring into the void. Superman tells him that they need to go back, but Kal-El suddenly tries to step off into that void. No. I don't feel like I belong on Earth. I belong elsewhere. I belong out there in the void. kal cries, floating free, but Superman snatches him by the cape, and the flashes begin to run, pulling them all back to Earth-1. When they arrive back at Earth, the treadmill lays destroyed at their feet. I think we should call in everyone we know, Wally tells them. Later, the heroes have gathered at Titan's Tower, and the groups discuss coming to the conclusion that there is only one Earth left now. A new Earth that combines parts of all of the ones that came before. Pariah goes on telling them. Some of the heroes from Earth 2, such as Huntress and Dick Grayson of Earth 2, note that they don't belong here. That no one remembers them, that their lives, they never existed here. When suddenly the room is filled with a new light as Harbinger arrives. I summoned you here because this new Earth is in peril. She begins to explain that those who stood at the dawn of time were saved when the new Earth was formed, with a single history. The heroes of the other worlds no longer belong in the history of this new Earth, and they stand out as paradoxes. Dismayed to find his world and his wife gone, Kal-El flies out of the building in anger. Superman giving chase, trying to calm the elderly version of himself. Everyone is shocked, and Garth turns to look at the sky outside of the windows. Police, not the funny weather again, he groans, and the skies begin to fill with the dark red clouds once again, spreading over the earth almost instantly. Lightning and energy crackle down from the sky, striking the earth. Help me! Pariah begins to scream as he once again begins to drift away from reality. I feel the tug of evil again! And he is gone. The earth begins to shake beneath their feet, and it suddenly shifts into space, with both Superman looking up into the black sky. Great Scott! The Earth shifted into another universe, Kal-El notes, before pointing up into the sky. The image of the Anti-Monitor floats before them, and the Earth hears his icy voice. Welcome to my universe. Welcome to your doom! The dark sky is filled with the image of the Anti-Monitor as he addresses the people of the one remaining Earth. Since my birth, ten billion years ago, I have not known defeat. A thousand universes before yours have perished without resistance. But you refuse to die. A thousand meaningless victories because you resisted my efforts to destroy you. One universe protected by one small, terribly insignificant world. I offer you my congratulations. I acknowledge your persistence. Your will to live is astonishing, but your world must die. My warriors will stain your world with blood. They will be everywhere and cannot be stopped. Hear the death kneel, humans. It is the last sound that you will ever hear. With those last words, the light from the Anti-Monitor's image disappears and the world is plunged into darkness. 
The supermen look around, shocked to find the people of the world screaming and running in fear. But before the two men can move, Harbinger appears before them, a light in the dark. She tells them, it is the time to act for the best of you to attack. Are you ready? She takes their hands and the three disappear, and she travels quickly, gathering the heroes that she will need for the final assault against the Anti-Monitor. Elsewhere in the world, the darkness begins to shift. It begins to move, and it suddenly separates, becoming thousands of shadow warriors. The demons moving across the earth, attacking everyone that they find. And as the demons attack, the heroes of this new earth move to defend its people across the entire globe. With her heroes gathered, Harbinger stands ready, and she turns to Alexander Luther, the last survivor of Earth-3. Using his powers of positive and antimatter, he opens a portal for the heroes, and the final battle has begun. The heroes emerge once more on the antimatter world of Quard. We've made it this far. Now what? Kal-El asks, and everyone agrees. But Wally turns, shocked to see an image of the Flash before them. He races forward, discovering Psycho Pirate trying to desperately pull the Flash's uniform from the rubble where he fell, where he died. The villain has gone insane. The Flash is no more. Wally takes his former mentor's ring to honor him. Once he realizes what happened here, but Pariah interrupts the morning, warning the heroes that he senses great evil just over the next rise. The heroes round the corner, walking straight into the massive form of the Anti-Monitor. You fools! The moment you stepped on Quard, it was too late. It is the day the universe dies. The heroes launch their attack with energy striking the Anti-Monitor, while the most powerful heroes lash out against him with mighty blows. Even the raw power of Superman doesn't seem to be enough, but they know that they are merely supposed to be distracting the cosmic villain. Because away from that battle, Harbinger, Dr. Light, and Alexander Luther stand on a floating asteroid, watching it. Harbinger points to the star that the Anti-Monitor is absorbing for his power, and she tells Dr. Light that she needs to absorb the energy from the sun to drain the power from the Anti-Monitor. I don't know if I can, Dr. Light stutters, but she sets herself and promises to try. The others leave as the light begins and the energy courses from the star into her. Meanwhile, at the battle, the Anti-Monitor looks up shocked. What is happening? My power is being drained. He cries out as the heroes fly around him and seeing him weakened, Alex lashes out with his own power, draining the Anti-Monitor's power directly from the villain. But Alexander Luther knows that even this won't be enough to stop him. I told you time and time again, I cannot be destroyed. The Anti-Monitor screams, you will die. Then your very universe will follow you into oblivion. I will tolerate no further defeat. He bellows. Seeing this battle, Pariah looks down at Negative Woman, asking if she is ready. Do I have a choice? She asks, and in reaching out, she extends her radioactive essence to wrap around the Anti-Monitor. With this down, the heroes begin to pour on the attack. Radiation, heat vision, fire, energy blasts! They hit the Anti-Monitor with everything that they have, the blows causing the villain to stumble and fall, and Pariah shouts to Dr. Light, NOW! He screams! Light nods, finally redirecting all of the energy that she has absorbed, hitting the monster with one final blow. And the Anti-Monitor's body explodes with light. His eternal organs burning through the armor and flesh, his body slamming into the ground, smashing through the rock as if it were water. He lays there in smoking ruins. I was expecting more satisfaction, Superman notes, and Wonder Woman nods, pointing to where Alexander Luther is summoning them. He tells them that with the power that he absorbed, he can open a portal to return the Earth and its heroes where they belong. But my power is not infinite, and I can't keep the pathway open for long. You must hurry through. He warns them. He flies forward to the Earth, stretching the energy of his body to open up the portal. And the Earth begins to slide back through, back into its own universe. The heroes, gathering the wounded, they set forth, flying towards the opening and behind them. No one notices the twinkle in the anti-monitor's eyes. Superman turns back, seeing the shadow demons moving towards the planet of Quard. I don't like this, he whispers. And there's an explosion of light, and the anti-monitor rises again. Fools, I have absorbed the power of the anti-matter demons. Once again, I am indestructible. He bellows, rising from his new grave. We have to stop him, Wonder Woman yells, and with a blast, the anti-monitor disintegrates her before Pariah's eyes. 
The heroes turn, Superman and Lady Quark preparing for the final battle, but suddenly Kal-El is there knocking them both out. Sorry, this is the only way, he tells them, handing them to Superboy Prime. Take them back to Earth and stay there, Kal-El orders them. I know what needs to be done. Do what I say and no arguments. Superboy Prime nods, turning and flying the two heroes back through the portal, but Kal-El turns back to the Anti-Monitor as the village is growing closer. You stayed behind, Kryptonian. Then you are the greatest fool that I have ever known! The Anti-Monitor laughs at him. Ugly, you may be right, but someone had to stay behind to clean up the garbage. The Anti-Monitor suddenly begins to writhe in pain and Kal-El nods. The demons that he has absorbed were changed by the magicians of Earth, and now they are killing him from the inside out. He launches forward, pounding into the massive villain, the blow sending the monster reeling away. Meanwhile, Superboy Prime reaches the portal, but can't leave behind the great hero. He throws Superman and Lady Quark through the portal and turns back, with Alexander Luther turning, no longer able to hold that portal open. Unknown to him, the being known as Darkseid is watching the battle through his eyes, using Apocalyptian tech. Kal-El grabs the nearby moon, launching it at the Anti-Monitor, smashing it into the monster. Superboy flies in to help, but the Anti-Monitor blasts him with energy, dropping him out of the sky. So Kal-El grabs two asteroids, smashing him into the Anti-Monitor to continue to weaken him. The blow launches the Anti-Monitor through space, two million miles before he comes to a halt. And Kal-El follows, throwing another moon at him, and that blow finishes the Anti-Monitor. You okay, pal? Kal-El asks, flying to Superboy Prime. The young man nods, but their rest is short-lived as the Anti-Monitor rises again. His body quakes with energy as he reaches out for the two heroes. I will kill you, even if I must die myself. He bellows, all seems lost, but Alexander turns his gaze upon the Anti-Monitor and Darkseid cannot allow the Anti-Monitor to survive, for he one day will turn his sights on Apocalypse. He transfers his power through Alex, and the being launches an energy blast that tears the Anti-Monitor apart. The Anti-Monitor is already weakened, and the blast launches him into the center of the closest star. He screams in pain as he sinks deeper into its core, and then he is destroyed. Shortly afterwards, Kal-El, Superboy, and Alex stand upon an asteroid in the negative universe. What now, Alex? Any chance on reopening that portal? Kal-El asks, but Alexander informs him that he cannot. Personally, I don't mind being here, but I'm so sorry that you two are stuck with me, the elderly hero tells them. But suddenly they turn as the energy of the Anti-Monitor launches itself out of the star, screaming across the cosmos, Superman, I will not die till I kill you! He screams and the hero launches forward, gritting his teeth. I've had enough! Kal-El bellows, hitting the Anti-Monitor with one last super punch. The blow dissipates the Anti-Monitor's energy, sending it back into the stars. The energy causes a reaction, sending out a wave that will destroy everything that it touches. Well, then I guess we'll wait till the wave hits us. There's no way that we can fly far enough away in time, Kal-El tells them, sadness in his voice. I don't think I mind dying. Not now, Superboy Prime tells him. We fought the good fight. We succeeded. I only wish Lois were here, Kal-El sighs. Suddenly, Alexander Luther begins to glow behind them. She is alive, Superman! Alex opens a small portal, and Superman is shocked to see his Lois stepping through. Alexander tells him that he knew how the universe would be reborn and did not want Superman to suffer. Lois hugs Clark crying, telling him that she was in a beautiful place. Come to me, and we'll all go there, to the new universe. Alex beckons them. So Superman and Lois nod, taking each other's hands, Superboy Prime with them, and together the group crosses into paradise. The portal closing as the wave of destruction hits the location that they just were. And there you have it, the Crisis on Infinite Earths full story. Now, normally we don't do full stories this close to when the regular videos came out, but I honestly could not figure a better time to put this video out, considering this is the ending of the CW event, and the chances of them doing another hyped up crisis kind of thing is going to be pretty slim. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and don't forget to subscribe if you want to see these things on a daily basis. And you can also hit that like button to let us know that you did enjoy it. Also, let me know in the comments down below what you thought of the CW event. I'd really want to know your opinions on it. And I'll see you guys next time, right here at Comic Story.